I've made the argument in the past that World War I changed the world more than World War II. Yes, World War II killed more people and set up a Cold War that would dominate geopolitics for the next 50 years, but World War I ended the domination of multiple empires that had lasted for hundreds of years. And it set up a new regime of democratic nation states that so disrupted the world order that it led to a second world war just to sort things out. It also led to this. This is Jocelyn Wildenstein, a Swiss socialite who was known for her addiction to plastic surgery. By the 1990s, she'd had so many facial reconstructions that she took on the appearance of a cat, leading the tabloids to dub her the Catwoman. And she was in the tabloids a lot. She married a billionaire art dealer named Alec Wildenstein and was a fixture of New York's high society in the 80s and 90s. They had a pretty nasty divorce in 1999 when she caught him in bed with a 21-year-old Russian model, and at one point he apparently pulled a gun on her. Swell guy. But she got her revenge getting $2.5 billion in the divorce and still managed to go bankrupt by 2018. She lived an uh, extravagant life. And no, she didn't spend all that money on plastic surgery, but she did spend millions over the years. We may never know exactly what demons drove her to do this to herself, but people get plastic surgery for all kinds of reasons, often that have nothing whatsoever to do with vanity. Like people with disfigurements, it actually gives them a chance to just live a normal life without people staring at them everywhere they go. Which brings me back to World War I. World War I was the first fully mechanized war, which led to trench warfare. And in trench warfare, the part of your body that's exposed the most is your head and the face that's on it. So anytime you gotta shoot at the enemy, you gotta lift your head up above the trench, which makes you a target. Or even if you just wanna stretch your legs, you're now exposed. But even if you stay hunched down, if a large enough caliber bullet hits the bridge up here, then pieces of wood and, and dirt and debris will fly in your face. Any mortar shells that land over there is gonna throw shrapnel right at your face. And don't even get me started on incendiary devices and, and chemical weapons like mustard gas. The point is, because of this, tens of thousands of World War I vets went home with horrifying facial disfigurements, which required a whole new type of surgery. Although it wasn't entirely new. In 1862, an American Egyptologist named Edwin Smith bought an ancient papyrus that was written in hieratic script, which is kind of like a cursive form of hieroglyphics. And it turned out this was like kind of a medical textbook for treating war injuries. And some of these injuries included head and face injuries. In fact, it had instructions on how to rebuild a nose. And it was thought they were doing this as far back as 6,000 BCE. There's also evidence this was being done in India too, and that they were actually doing skin grafts by 800 BCE. The Romans had records of reconstructive surgery between 100 BCE and the fifth century AD, with some texts describing how to repair damaged ears. There's also a medical writer at the time named Aulus Cornelius Celsus, who described using skin from other parts of the body to repair injuries, kind of like a skin graft. Now, these were mostly to repair war wounds, um, not necessarily to improve one's looks. The first cleft palate operation was done in the United States in 1827 by Dr. John Peter Mataillier, who now is known as America's first plastic surgeon. Um, they didn't call him that at the time, though, because plastic wasn't a thing yet. Also, can you imagine getting a cleft palate operation with no anesthesia? Ugh. And the first tummy tuck was performed in France in 1890. So yes, there was reconstructive surgery going all the way back. There was also body modification, which is kind of a different thing. Many cultures engaged in that, like the skull deforming of the Inca and the Maya or the Chinese practice of foot binding. And you could make the argument that this is analogous to plastic surgery um, in the sense that it was people, you know, changing themselves to fit a culturally agreed upon beauty standard at the time. Uh, that's not really what we're talking about here, though. In professional parlance, uh, plastic surgery is used to describe a broad range of procedures that are done to either enhance or change a person's body, either for aesthetic or corrective reasons. So yeah, cosmetic and reconstructive procedures both fall under the term plastic surgery. But really, when you hear plastic surgery, most people think of cosmetic procedures, things like liposuction, breast surgery, or lip fillers. According to a 2020 study, around 16 million cosmetic surgeries are done in the US every year. I did the math, that's 4.7% of the population. Although I'm sure some people get multiple plastic surgeries, so it might not be quite right. And some of the most popular procedures are faceless, eyelid surgery, and nose jobs. Which kind of makes sense. You know, our faces are kind of our calling card. It's what people first look at. It's what we identify with. It's what people picture when they think of you. But also, let's just be honest with ourselves here. Looks matter. And I'm not just talking about in dating. That's, that's, that's obvious, but professionally as well. People who are considered more attractive are more likely to get hired for jobs and on average make higher salaries. Even in the court system, more attractive people pay lower bail and get shorter jail sentences. And by the way, it's not just adults with, you know, 
certain social conditioning that brings this about. Even babies have been shown to have a preference, specifically for people with more symmetrical faces and more feminine features. Like I've talked before about Uncanny Valley and how we really are just like hardwired for faces. And there's just something in our lizard brains that just kind of struggle to process faces that don't look right. And it is very much a lizard brain thing. A neuroimaging study from 2019 showed that people have implicit negative biases against people with disfigured faces without even knowing that they harbor these biases. It showed diminished neural responses in our interior cingulate cortex, which basically shows that we're just inherently less empathetic toward people with disfigurements. I mean, there's a reason why villains in movies are often portrayed with facial injuries or deformities. It's, it's like a cheat code to our lizard brains. It just it instantly makes us more distrustful or fearful of that character. Of course, it's not always about looks, you know, personality goes a long way. Uh, but one of the things that people are most attracted to in personalities is confidence. And people with more attractive faces tend to project more confidence. And that, that's partly because of how we perceive attractive faces, but it's also partly because they generally have more confidence because they've They've always had a little bit of an advantage and, and that confidence itself is even more attractive. So people with, let's use the term, abnormal facial features uh, tend to have a bit of a disadvantage socially. Doesn't mean they can't overcome them, just they, they do have to work a little bit harder than others. You know, just one more thing to kind of drive this point home. There's some photos of World War I vets uh, that I wanna show in this video, but I probably can't because I might get demonetized for using shocking imagery. That's how strongly we enforce our facial standards. So at the end of World War I, we had these thousands of soldiers coming home with extreme facial disfigurements like we'd never seen in any war previously. And like we tend to do in society, instead of welcoming them as heroes, they were often treated as pariahs. Like imagine giving that much for your country and carrying with you all the physical and mental trauma that comes along with that, only to have like children cry at the sight of you and women gasp when you walk by like you're some kind of monster. Like for example, there was a town in England that, that set aside certain park benches and painted them blue, specifically for disfigured veterans to sit on. And that blue was like a code for everybody else to warn them that somebody sitting there might be too uncomfortable to look at. But what's really more upsetting is the fact that some of the people who are the most horrified to look at these soldiers were the soldiers themselves. Like a lot of hospital wards would actually ban mirrors so that the patients couldn't see themselves and go into shock. As American surgeon Dr. Fred Albee said, quote, it is a fairly common experience for the maladjusted person to feel like a stranger to his world. It must be an unmitigated hell to feel like a stranger to yourself. It was clear that something needed to be done so that these men could feel like their normal selves again. And one of those things was masks. Anna Coleman Ladd was a successful sculptor who had solo exhibitions in New York, DC, and Philadelphia between 1907 and 1915. In 1917, she and her husband moved to France, and that's where she learned about Francis Derwent Wood, who made face masks at his Ten Noses shop, also known as the Masks for Facial Disfigurement Department. Wood was a British sculptor who had worked on World War I soldiers to help them to kind of regain a sense of normalcy with their disfigured faces. The men were able to get jobs, be with their families, and just kind of feel like they were part of society again. As he told The Lancet in 1917, quote, My work begins where the work of the surgeon is completed. When the surgeon has done all he can to restore functions, I endeavor by means of the skill that I happen to possess as a sculptor to make a man's face as near as possible to what it looked like before he was wounded. He would create the mask by first making a plaster cast of the person's face, and then he would use clay or plasticine to kind of reshape what the healed face would look like with its missing features replaced. The final cast was actually made from a thin sheet of copper that was actually 1 32nd of an inch thick, and it was coated in silver and painted a cream color and then topped with varnish for complexion. He'd then match the face's contours, pigmentation, and texture to match the patient's skin. And if, say, an eye was missing, he might even just paint it directly on the mask. He'd also paint eyebrows onto the mask, and he would actually use thin metallic foil that he would cut into strips and tint it and curl it and then solder it into place. Keep in mind, this was kind of before plastic. But the masks weren't comfortable. I mean, they were made out of metal. And the man had kind of a love-hate relationship with them. You know, it kind of gave them a little bit more autonomy in the world, but it would also... It was also kind of a painful reminder of what they used to look like. But Lab was inspired by Wood's work. So she met with the American Red Cross and convinced them that she could do the same thing here in America. So they helped her open up her own place called the Studio for Portrait Masks in 1918. From the beginning, Lad's studio was meant to be a warm and inviting place. She and her assistants would joke around with the men, trying to make them feel at home. As she said, quote, they were never treated as though anything were the matter with them. We'd laugh with them, help them to forget. This is what they longed for and deeply appreciated. 
Like wood, she made the masks out of copper and silver, and she painted them while the patients were wearing them so she could match the skin colors correctly. She often used glasses, like fake glasses, to keep the masks in place, but, you know, if the patient didn't want to wear glasses, she could make a ribbon or a thin wire to make it work. The whole process took about a month to complete, and a mask was considered successful when a patient could walk down a street in Paris without being noticed. By the end of 1919, she'd created around 185 masks, and she basically donated her creative services. She just charged $18 uh, for each mask. That's equal to about 375 today. But once the war ended, the Red Cross couldn't afford to fund her studio anymore, so she closed shop. She went back to the U.S. where she lived her life as an artist until she died at age 60 in 1939. While the masks did offer some sense of normalcy to the soldiers, there were some limitations to them. For one thing, they were made of that super thin copper like I was talking about, so they were really easily damaged and would eventually show signs of wear and tear. They were also static, you know, it didn't really restore a patient's function or movement. And they also only covered the damaged areas of a patient's face, like the eye, the chin, the mouth, nose. So even with a good paint job, you could still kind of tell the person was wearing a mask. And of course the men would age over time, but the masks didn't. So yeah, over time, the difference in the texture between their skin and the mask would become too noticeable. Not to mention that they were painted on, and the paint would sometimes flake off, revealing a metal face underneath. Metal face. <laughs> that kind of sounds like a... Coming at you this Sunday! At the Poughkeepsie Civic Center, Tokamak and Stellarator featuring... Metal Face! On the Trium Tour! All your favorite face-melting metal bands commemorated in one epic t-shirt. Blood Falls. Nocturnal Death Syndrome. And Wind Witch. With all the dates and all the places. All the one places. The most brutal shirt for the most brutal band. So hot, it's radioactive. This is a limited time run, so get yours before it melts into oblivion. Buy now on LastSmarter.com. Trinium Tour! Seriously, this is a real shirt. You can go buy it. It was designed by an actual metal band artist. It's a really soft shirt. It's easily the most awesome merch we've ever created. So go to laughsmarter.com. There's a link down below or scan the QR code. Go check it out. It's only for a limited time. Go get it. Anyway, the masks helped, but they had some drawbacks. They weren't like a permanent solution. And this is where Dr. Harold Gillies comes in. Gilly studied medicine in England and specialized in ear, nose, and throat surgery before the war. And then he served during the war in the Royal Army Medical Corps. It was there that he met a French surgeon named Hippolyte Morriston. There's no way I'm saying that name right. Hip, hippo, hippo, Hippolyte? Hippolytes? Hippolyte? Anyway, Dr. Morriston. He was kind of the French Army's expert in like face and jaw injuries, and, and Gillies was impressed with what he was able to do, not to just repair the soldiers' faces, but to also reconstruct them. And then, you know, how much it improved those soldiers' lives. And he realized that he was kind of in a unique position with his background in like, you know, ear, nose, and throat surgeries, that that was maybe something that he could bring for the British Army. So he convinced the army that there was a need for this kind of special reconstructive care. And they agreed. They put up a unit under his command in the Queen Mary's Hospital in Sidcup, England. There he led a team of surgeons, nurses, and artists to help find permanent solutions for these soldiers. And they got super creative and came up with pioneering techniques that are still in use today. They took skin and cartilage from other parts of the body and built up areas that were missing tissue. He even used a patient's rib bone to create jaws and lobes and other structures of the face. Perhaps most famously, he helped come up with the tube pedicle, which is kind of gnarly to look at, but it's cool. So a skin graft is obviously when you transfer skin from one part of the body to another, but the problem with skin grafts is getting the blood vessels to connect to the new tissue. Because if you don't, that tissue just dies and now you've just got a patch of rotten skin which is not ideal. But with a tube pedicle, instead of just slicing off a chunk of skin to graft, you actually cut away a flap of skin, leaving one end of the flap connected to the original source of blood, and then you graft the other end of the place that you're grafting it to. That way the grafted skin can maintain blood flow while it's connecting to the blood vessels of the graft site, which takes a few weeks, but once it's established, you just snip the other end of the graft, and now you can use that skin to fix the spot that you're working on. This has a way higher success rate, and it cuts down drastically on infections. Two pedicles are used all the time in plastic surgery today. It was an absolute game changer, and it all started with Dr. Gilly's treatment of World War I vets. After the war, he practiced plastic surgery exclusively, and it actually got him a lot of criticism for that early on. You know, cosmetic surgery was kind of considered frivolous and not important work. But he argued that no, it, it is important work, you know, and it requires craft and skill, and it genuinely improves the lives of his patients. And I think it's safe to say that time has proven him right. You know, an, an entire industry grew up around his work that now is worth tens of billions of dollars. And while plastic surgery might still be something that people kind of scoff at a little bit, the fact of the matter is, um, we're all gonna get some work done at some point. You know, as we are living longer, our skin is gonna start doing some pretty unfortunate stuff, and that unfortunate stuff is gonna have to be taken off. 
Hell, I had minor skin cancer surgery about 10 years ago, like right up, right up here. And uh, yeah, it, it required a little bit of reconstruction to make it so you can't see it anymore. So yeah, and it probably won't be the last, unfortunately. But I mean, even plastic surgery that's done just to enhance your attractiveness, that, that has its place. It, it, it has a positive mental health benefit. There are many studies that show that people who undergo plastic surgery, like Botox, breast augmentation, rhinoplasty, that kind of thing, they are more satisfied with their lives, even up to five years after their surgeries. Of course, there is a flip side to that. There are some people that have, you know, negative feelings about their their you know situation after their operations. You know, from everything from post-operative complications, the way it's changed their relationships, and of course, there's body dysmorphic disorder issues. There are always going to be people who take it too far, but they deserve our empathy, not our derision. Which brings me back to Jocelyn Wildenstein, who I actually found out while I was researching this video. She actually just passed away in December, so yeah. R.I.P. Jocelyn. I'll avoid making a joke about her having eight more lives. I can't help but wonder, and this is total speculation, but I can't help but wonder if like the glut of disfigured soldiers kind of contributed to the end of the carnival sideshows. Like, like maybe suddenly it didn't seem so cool to exploit people with disfigurements anymore. Because once upon a time, these guys would have been put on a stage and, and gawked at as like the man with the inside out face. Although some of the time would have made the argument that the sideshow was a good thing for them because it allowed them to, you know, make a living in a world that otherwise would have shunned them. It's an interesting topic. It's a subject I've always been curious about, you know, the whole human oddities thing, which is why I included an episode on that in my Mysteries of the Human Body series over on Nebula. If you haven't seen it, it's a six part series on well, mysteries of the human body, from human oddities to rare and unusual diseases, unexplained plagues, and even the mystery of why we age and die. Not to freak you out, but there's, there's still a lot we don't know about this. We shot it a few years back. I've always been super proud of it. We had a professional set built for it. We had higher end graphics than you're used to seeing here. Um, like, if you've ever kind of wondered, what would Joe be like if he was, you know, better? Well, there's your answer, which is kind of the whole point of Nebula. It's a streaming service by and for creators like me where we can upload our videos uncensored and ad-free and allows us to experiment with bigger and better productions free of all the restrictions we all have on YouTube. Yeah, I probably had to fuzz out a few pictures on this video. The Nebula version is defuzzed. It's not just me, there are a couple hundred thoughtful and fun creators doing the same thing like real engineering, window productions, real science, and real life lore. Yeah, that's a lot of reels. We keep it real over there. I've had people tell me that it's kind of like a curated list of their favorite creators, but with extra content and no ads. If that sounds awesome to you, you can follow my link in the description. It's nebula.tv slash Joe Scott, and you'll get 40% off the annual subscription, bringing it to $36 a year, or just $3 a month. Or if you're trying to cut down on subscriptions, they do have a one-time payment option. They actually offer a lifetime subscription. It's $300, but you'll get Nebula basically forever. Forever is a long time. You might not even live that long. So go check it out, it's an awesome service and it helps support me and lots of other creators. Links down below. All right, thank you guys so much for watching. I thought this was an interesting look at, uh, you know, just one more thing that World War I changed about the world. If you guys, if this is your first time here, um, maybe check out this video. YouTube thinks you'll like that one. Um, or check out any of the other videos that might be on your feed that have my name on it. Check them out, if you enjoy them, I invite you to subscribe. Uh, I come back with videos sometimes. And one last time, go check out that Tridian Tour shirt on LastMarter.com. That's our new merch site. Um, we finally got it up and running. It's been in the works for quite some time. Uh, the shirt's amazing. It is very soft. I'm not wearing it right now. I don't know why I'm doing that. But that's it for today. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next time. <laughs> Love you guys. Take care.